I'll just say that I hope that uh, some of you were able to see uh, Life of Pi yesterday. It got the festival off to a fantastic start. We're very, very, very uh, thrilled to have the film uh, here. And we're also, of course, thrilled this afternoon to have uh, Ang Lee with us to discuss uh, not only Life of Pi, but his entire career, which is certainly one of the most uh, adventurous, unexpected, eclectic, uh, and absolutely fascinating uh, careers that I can think of in modern cinema. So without further ado, let's welcome Ang Lee. Thank you, Todd. Thank you for coming. Well, it must have been a thrill last night because uh, you've been working on this film for so long, probably longer than any film you've, you've made, just to, to Twice, make it. Yeah. Twice, double, double the length. <laughs> and um, just to finally have it done uh, and now in front of an audience must, uh, must be a thrilling experience. Uh, yes, actually, I was kind of relieved. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have time to like really enjoy it. Actually, yesterday, I was running around and introducing the film. I have a sense it's kind of working, so I started deflate and I was like, <laughs> <laughs> I felt I was in the battle zone for so long, for nearly four years. A lot of anxiety, and uncertainties, doubt, as the movie says. Like I was being tested, taking battles, not with necessarily with people, but. What, whatever is in front of you. It was your own 200... Even a week ago, I was oh. still uncertain. Um, well. La last Sunday, I put it together uh, before I do some further tuning. The, for the first time, I saw all the elements sort of, sort of put together, and at the end, I started stopping. Not moved by the movie, I was just like, oh. Yeah. <laughs> well. So it is a relief uh, yesterday, so I could not think of anything that's beyond being relieved. Well, uh, I would, we'll talk about Life of Pi a little bit, obviously, but uh, we would, I hope you can uh, relax a little bit. We can speak about your entire uh, career in life because it's certainly been, uh, uh, as I said, an adventurous and very interesting one. But my big question about Pi is that, as we know, Fox uh, bought the film 10 years ago and uh, other directors tried to make the film and so on. And what was it that gave you the confidence that it could actually be realized properly on screen, because uh, this is a, it takes you to another world that uh, we've never really been in before, and it's an exceptionally beautiful film. But what, what convinced you that you could pull this film off and uh, to join on board with it? Uh, I was never convinced, even to this day, <laughs> <laughs> to be honest with you. But that's not what it is about. Like I know how to do it. I want to show how how it's done. It was never like that. It's like, yeah, that's the adventure I want to go. Whether you decide to make the leap or not. Uh, it's only that decision. When I first read the book is shortly after the book came out. Somebody introduced me, oh, that's an interesting book. I remember thinking nobody in their right mind would put 15 million into this movie. It's like, it's a philosophical book. It's cinematic written, fascinating, mind-boggling, but it'd be too expensive. And we don't even know if we can do it. So it's so much unknown, and there's no way it should be um, an art house film or not an art house film. So it's kind of it's stuck in the middle. Um, so I put it aside. But it's it's it's, it's a project keep haunting me. Uh, when I say it's haunting me, it's not like this is the greatest book I ever read. It's just their elements just keep bugging me. Something I want to find out. And then about four years ago, four or five years ago, Fox started to you know, approach me. Um, I didn't really want to <laughs> believe anybody would do that. Take what it takes to make to find out what it's, it's, it's going to be like. Um, but then my friend Tom, I think he's here today. He, he called me. First, Elizabeth Gabler. Mm -hmm. It's her film. Uh, she approached me. Eight months pursuing. Oh, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. And then Tom, I read this, the previous script before me. It's a good script, and the second story is in there. I said, okay, they're they mm -hmm. meant, they're gonna do this. And Tom gave me a number like around that range. I'll do it. Um, 
maybe they really want to do it. So it's a long decision process, it's not like one day, ah, oh, I got it. Uh, actually, one of the pivotal point is when I thought of 3D, uh, maybe if I add another dimension, maybe it'll work. Maybe I have a chance. It's a silly idea. I didn't even know what 3D meant. <laughs> um, then I started to thought about it can, if I can have a narrator, because the book has a, it's a very mature voice mm -hmm. about a 16-year-old boy. So if I can find a mature voice, maybe I can. Yeah. Then I thought about in the preface, there's Yamatel fake this story about how he got a story. So I make that kind of a reality. It's also kind of a joke, but you know, I started to see things working. And as I was in the process, I, I kind of fall into the trap. Um, then we went through an adventure. I can spend three days tell you what happened. Um, it's constant decision making. It's actually a venture. Eventually, I become the movie I'm making. I'm like pie, uh, drifting across the Pacific with the tigers. Like, um, and yesterday, I feel I was ashore. <laughs> well, I thought last night I thought Richard Pena made a very good uh, had a good, very good insight into your career. Uh, is that um, I mean you. Uh, each project is such a surprise, so, much, so very different from the one before. And then he said, you know, the way we usually think about great directors is uh, they kind of establish their own world and they work within that world and so on. But then there's some, and I think, uh, Ang, you represent this, that each film is like a new exploration, a new exploration maybe of uh, your own interests, uh, aspects of yourself, aspects of things that maybe you don't know about that you want to find out about. How, do, how did you, uh, how do you feel about that kind of uh, description? Does that it sit make me sit well with you, yeah. <laughs> yeah. When he's introducing me, you know him in New York Festival, which I regard as a high brow festival. Uh, yeah, I just keep sweating, and I don't know it's the suit or whatever. It's it's actually quite uncomfortable. Uh, it's actually it's not only talk about you know, a great or even good filmmaker. He's talking about auteur. Yeah. Uh, what does that mean? What does that French word means? Uh, you have many interpretations. Am I a tour, or I'm just like, I, you see, I always thought of myself as filmmakers. We don't know people, studios, or you know, film critics <laughs> categorize us. I think we're a bunch of racing horses. You know, we're at the the gate. You know, once the gate goes, we just run the run, and the studio could sort of rein us a little bit, or producer. <laughs> <laughs> and and people, you know, judges who runs first or whatever. Uh, we don't know. We like have a like a tunnel vision. Mm -hmm. we're, we're like that. We just yeah. So for me, there are the movies I want to make. I, I don't know what kind of filmmaker I am, or even am I an author. If people say I am, I am. And some don't see me as an author because how can an author go? You know, different genres. Um, so I, I don't know myself. I don't know the answer. It's up to people to categorize my myself. But I, I'll say a few things regarding to that. Uh, I have a lot of curiosity. I feel my career is like a prolonged film school. I, I just love to learn how to make movies. How do you do this? How do you do that combat scene? How do you put boys? with guns on horseback, uh, how, how do you fly, you know, putting a wire on people, just yank them this way, and slash them that way. Uh, now, for different genres, I get to learn movies from all those great filmmakers, like Hong Kong action choreographer, that's some of the greatest filmmakers. Here, they're, they make sure you're doing safely. Is the it's a storyboard artist that do the visualization. And, and in Hong Kong, is the choreographer. The people didn't go to school. They're some of the smartest filmmakers. And how about England, those you know, dry sense of humor. The, the, every place, they have their way of filmmaking. That just fascinates me. I just want to learn from them. And my biggest pleasure in making movies, watching people good at what they're doing they're, when they're focused. They're like, Pi training the tiger, he's in the God zone. Nothing else but it. They don't need church, they don't need nothing. When I, no, I met as a pilot, 
He's like the best assistant director in the world. Like three aircrafts in the air, and he's coordinate with the cameraman. He must be like a great cinematographer, the best AD. In seconds, you know, in the stretch of from here to there, nothing bump, you know, kill anybody. Mm -hmm. Catch that light doing this shadow, you know, all the calculation, and he's like in that zone. It just fascinates me. Or the tiger trainer in this movie. Why day after day, as long as he can, he he needs to go to that. You know, tigers don't play. They're not actors. When they do this, they're for real. And you do anything <laughs> wrong, when you're out of the zone for half a bit of a second, make the wrong decision, you're dead. So when people are in that zone. No, some of us is to leave for this kind of thing. So I don't know why, why Life of Pi take me there, but it's, there's a calling. When there's a calling, or what does a Wyoming gay cowboy has anything to do with me? I don't know. I grew up in Taiwan. Uh, <laughs> but why did I cry over that? You know, why do I want to go to that mountain? Why did I not go to this you know, and that? I seem to be a nice guy. Why did I make Hulk? I don't know. <laughs> Or American Civil War. I, I know I keep identify with the losing side. Anybody lose, I have great sympathy for it. I want to make about them. I don't want to make the Yankees, but I make the you know, people lose the war in the South. I, I don't know. Uh, I don't know why a floating island attracts me. I, you know, I don't know those things. Sometimes after the movie, people ask you to give them answers, and I, I don't really <laughs> have them. I, I literally, I feel like a racing horse. Those, it's like there's a fate, there's a calling in me. When I feel that, I have to jump in and make the movie. So I, I, I don't really know if I'm an author or not. I just feel like I, I just love to be basking in this large film school mm -hmm. that just keep making movies one after another, and people seem to respond, a lot of them. Yeah. It changes their lives. <laughs> It changed my life. Uh, I live for that kind of thing. Well, I would love to explore a little bit about something I don't know much about, which is your uh, youth and uh, upbringing and how you uh, latched on to cinema in the first place. Uh, what kind of a kid were you? Were you uh, reading a lot, seeing movies, a uh, cultural family? Uh, what, what was your, how did you get on the track that took you into the arts? I, I was a very uh, spaced out and docile kid. Nothing showed I would be an artist in the future. And the way I grew up was very uh, repressed in that way, and artistically. Uh, some of you grew up in that environment in Asia, maybe. Uh, go to a good college and be useful, man, is the thing to do. Basically, academic life, which I could not put my, my focus on. I was a very docile child. I was never rebellious. I never felt rebellious until I was like 45. And I started <laughs> to make martial art films. I started to defy this and that. It never really come out, or hulk out, as you say. Yeah. Um, I never say a word again. My father is a very stately man. He's the principal of my high school. That's, that's pretty bad. <laughs> uh, he's a good principal. I was a good student. Um, and that was the best high school in Taiwan. So it was very boring. I don't really have any play or I play a little bit of basketball weekends, watch one movie, two movies a week probably. Uh, I was just very spaced out. My mind is drift. I, I don't know. So how did you uh, discover? I felt like oh. a lot of waste of my time. Mm -hmm. But I was brooding, I guess. Mm -hmm. And then I flunked the college examination. I felt like a loser. Uh, and because, you know, in Taiwan you have to do military service when you reach 20, so I, I got into the Academy of Art. Um, you know, just nobody paid attention, just so I had like a hideout place before the <coughs> next year's exam, national exam. Uh, and first time I stood on stage, it just bang on. You know, I was electrified. I was saying, that's it, that's, I remember the spotlights like this shining on my eyes. I sort of can feel, it wasn't like this, that you, you're lit. You know, it was dark out there, and I feel I belong to somewhere in the dark. And like my soul started to come out or something. Um, that I, I want, that's what I want to do. I was 18 years old. 
That's the first time I had a taste of art or theatrical or dramatic experience. And ever since, I just keep learning what I like to learn. A uh, big pivotal time was I came to the state. Actually, I start, um, you know, the, the ac actual really good dramatic education. I went to NYU film school. But didn't you um, go to Chicago first? Uh, Champagne. Yeah, because I wondered, wasn't that a rather big deal or bold thing to do to decide you're come, gonna come to the States uh, no, to every, study at every, that time? Every good student sort of come abroad mm. at that time in Taiwan. We finished college, you finish your military service, and then you go abroad, mostly to America. You know, to go further study, that give you a life, like a better start, whether you go, to tai go back to Taiwan or stay here. Um, so I just follow, well, my father didn't want me to go to, you know, do anything entertaining. So I sort of made a deal with him, just just let me do this. I'll go to a theater school, uh, study theater, get a degree in America, maybe I can start teaching. You know, uh, so maybe sometime you grow up, and say, you know, change your mind, so you can still have like a, a respectable job. Yeah. So that's why I came here. But of course I never did that. You know, um, what I did sense sensibility, my father said, you know, at this rate, I got seven nominations for the Oscar. At this rate, maybe you'll get your first Oscar in age 50. Maybe you can start teaching things, something for real. <laughs> <laughs> You're happy? Yeah. <laughs> um, but that's my relation with my yeah. father. Yeah. Are you an only child? No, my, I have a younger brother and okay. two older sisters. So was that your first uh, trip to the United States when you came to be a student here? Had you been out yeah. of Taiwan uh, much In before Taiwan, that? Taiwan didn't speak much English no? at all. I spoke like uh, you saw the sailor on the screen. Yeah. You must uh, go, like that sort of English. Uh, half of the class I didn't understand, but I was learning, taking a lot. So what was it like for you at NYU? Uh, did you make uh, friends, associations, uh, wh what were you actually doing? Uh, did you start making, making movies, films yourself? what yeah. I really like to do. Yeah. I was like really happy and fulfilled. Yeah. So I, I love theater. I, I think at first I wanted to be an actor, but then I didn't speak English, I couldn't act, I couldn't get the parts, <laughs> and I had to direct, and I got so pissed. <laughs> As a young student, I thought, oh, theater, Directors are losers. The best ones go to acting, and I don't want to direct theater. Who cares about them? If I want, if I have to direct, I, I'll direct movies. So I, I got into at NYU, and it was like everything turned out to be so easy. Just sight and sound. Just go shoot stuff, tell a story with with the camera. So that was like easy. I don't need to speak much English. Well, Theater's talking head, it's, it's mm. very verbal culture. But uh, cinema is, it's, it's a strange thing, I just click right away. I did it because it's really easy, and, <laughs> and everybody listened to me. I, I don't know why, I didn't speak much English, I hardly had you know, much friend or anything, but on the set, it was three people, five guys, uh, people started listening to me. I said, put this here, it's, you know, there are people who, talk very smart, I don't know when, they really struggle with the camera. If I put somewhere, it just makes sense. So people start listening to me, I thought, oh, I must be like a natural film, filmmaker or something. <laughs> you see, when, when I did Sense Sensibility, I spoke broken English, and I direct Sense, you know, Jen Austin. After that movie, I thought, if I can do this, I can do anything in cinema. <laughs> <laughs> so after that, I'm, I'm like gone, like, I, I try anything. I, I, I'm still so impressed, even now, and after all the films you've made, that you had the guts to make that film, because uh, uh, I don't know if you'd spent any time in England before you made that. I went to school there. I grew up here with familiarity. I wouldn't dare make a film <laughs> about 19th century England because of the cultural nuances. So many uh, minute well, things I would be so... Out after uh, five uh, generations, actually, everybody's guess. So, but I found out after I directed. Um, um, well, I... In 1979, I took a summer, and I was, I was in Champagne. They have a program to study theater in England. 
So I did that study. Uh, Stratford and Avon, all the theaters in London. So that was a great program for me to have first taste of the British way of doing drama. I was very inspired, it, even though I was in awe, I was very afraid to be there because I didn't understand them. And back then, it seems to have an attitude. I, I was very afraid, actually. Um, and then I spent half a year in England. Uh, my cast and crew, they're very generous. So I had an educational sort of a half a year, just pick up what it takes um, to make that movie. Not only in you know, the English texture, but that was the first period piece I ever done. Um, it's a f my first taste, and after that, I don't want to do anything else. So the art department, all those people, they're very nice. They just explained to me. We went to the museum, go to s sites, um, paintings, literature, or costume, how it was done. And it was, you see, I, I didn't make those movies overnight. If I was put in that position, or even after I do a movie, if I have to talk about it, I don't know how to talk about them. Um, but making movie takes a long time. Uh, this one, nearly four years. At least a one year's process. So little by little, it's, it's how you survive every day, how you make decisions, how to learn about little things. It's very pragmatic. Uh, I, I really enjoy uh, that kind of process. And when you make a mistake, you can amend it. You know. uh, there are many ways to amend it. It's not like you flip and it's life and death. It's not like that. So this is a long process of learning, of adapting. And then I don't need to be an expert on anything. I just need to uh, make decision that's good for the movie. I could tell right from wrong. Uh, that's all I need at, at the moment. Or seemingly, you act like I know. <laughs> and then things will go on its own. And somehow you just see it. the movie wants to go certain ways. And y you have to listen to it. I always say, I, I, I pray to movie God. And it seems to be a voice saying, you know, the movie wants to be this way or that way. And I'm kind of learning and catching up. Uh, but I, as a director, I have to act like I know. <laughs> so pe <laughs> people can go about their business. Did you, who were, uh, did you have any interesting uh, colleagues or associates that uh, other students, fellow students at NYU that you became uh, close with or uh, that you, uh, were meaningful to you? Oh, uh, there are many of them at school. Uh, like I worked on Spike Lee's film. He was a year ahead of me. Um, the f some of you make film for 60 millimeter. You put your hands in the back to change rolls. You have to count 40 frames. And very easily you screw up somebody's film. My first time I, I was doing that blind, it was in his film. I, ch I changed five roles in a day. Uh, I don't know why he trusted me. I was a freshman. <laughs> uh, in his, his, uh, things like that. Yeah, we're, we're pals. We help each other making films. Um, probably other than Spike Lee, there won't be people you know. Um, Yeah, I guess that's yeah. it. There are some more known filmmakers, but they're um, not, not my contemporary. Well, at a certain point, uh, I think it's worth uh, uh, speaking about a little bit. You formed a very important association with James Seamus because he worked on many of your films. So how did you meet him, and what has that uh, collaboration been like over the years? Uh, well, that's a long story. Um, my first chance in cracking the movie business, I went some Taiwanese um, award for a script, and uh, the government's studio wanted to make that movie. But I was just writing to get the script competitions uh, awards, not to make them. So, but I, I, I didn't, after film school, there were six years I have nothing to do, bringing up kids, cooking, you know. Um, so, so I took the money, that's 400000 about to make a movie about a, a Chinese Tai Chi master and how, how his life is here. I didn't know what to do with the money. So through a neutral friend of ours, uh, I get to know Ted Hope, uh, which is his partner at Good Machine, uh, which is 
the previous life of Focus feature. Yeah. Uh, so I met the two guys, James and Ted. They were like, we're all kids. I walk in, I say, I have this money, I don't know what to do. Uh, can you produce a movie with this money? They said, look, we're the, the king of no-budget filmmaking in New York. I said, listen, it's not low budget, it's no budget. Uh, anyway, we sort of hit it off. James teaching at Columbia, and he looked like a, a professor and a used car salesperson. <laughs> and Ted was 28. Uh, he was a key PA in the person I know. No, now he wants to be a producer. They just hit it off. They formed this company, have two tables. Anyway, we made Pushing Hands. That was a hit in Taiwan, so I get a chance to make Wedding Banquet, my second movie. Uh, but I didn't go outside of Taiwan, so they said we try one more time. Um, and then he started to touch on my s s script, because it's, it's a story happened in New York. There's some English. So he touched it up. And, well, that's a long story. Anyway, th that put me on the map, and we win an award. And, you know. So I started to collaborate with James as a writer, producer, salesman, everything, because he's the only person sort of I know um, that has the knowledge and the ability that I don't have. Uh, actually, he's learning too. He was, I took him to England to do Sense and Sensibility. People thought he was my entourage, they don't know. And he faked his way into becoming a producer. <laughs> and. That we sort of grow up together. I never see him as a producer or even writer. Um, he's kind of my pal, you know, creative partner. Um, we feed off each other, and I, I regard him as a filmmaker. Um, and after the Hulk, he 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 started his company. Um, Focus feature, and then we we did Brokeback Mountain. He's both writer producer, and then he sit across the table, be, become the studio. Uh, so it's 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 a very fruitful collaboration uh, in our career. I, I don't think I can go this far without the help of company or feedback from James. And I, I think for him it's the same way. Uh, I don't know, I, I got to believe in faith. Why did I bump into him? When I decided to give them the money to do, produce uh, uh, Pushing Hands, I just hope that these two guys are not crooks. They don't take my money and <laughs> run, and what do I do? <laughs> um, but it, it just, it, it's a workout, and you know, we have a career. We both have careers, and this is the first movie. I, I decided I, I, I want to do some grow up, I'll try something without James, uh, Life of Pi. Uh, and last night he saw the movie, and we were very, both very emotional. And he was like, you fucking broke. <laughs> 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 you blow my mind. I don't have to come here and bullshit you. He was like, we're kind of in tears. Uh, no, I, I love him. Um, it meant a lot to me. Uh, we grew together. That's that you can't ask him. Uh, Anything more from a person, from a friendship, from a creative partner. Oh, that's, that's wonderful. When you went back to Taiwan then, after you were in New York, did you have any uh, contact or influence, any affiliation with the uh, Taiwanese uh, film industry and some of the filmmakers there? Even before, had you seen like King Hu's film at the earlier, and did you uh, meet Hu Shen and uh, some of the other directors who were, because Taiwan c cinema was coming up at a certain point, and uh, I just, or, if you, or were you working completely apart from these people? It's, it's both ways. In terms of actual working, um, I, I'm quite different. I, I live in New York City. I do my development and post-production here. I go anywhere to make movies, but my base is here. So, and I start out here. Uh, and I brought that New York independent film kind of filmmaking back to Taiwan. Uh, I think my work has certain impact on them. Um, I'm kind of the most famous Taiwanese filmmaker, you know. <laughs> if not in the art house circle, but like 
in the broader sense. Uh, I got an Academy Award, so this has got to be some impact uh, in the industry. And I brought this movie back to Taiwan, and the movie's done in Taiwan, so that's going to have some influence. Um, I, I'm friends with all of them. I consider myself the uh, same group. I, I very much like to be identified as a Taiwanese filmmaker. Um, you know, I like to be identified as a New York in indie too, but uh, I think at heart that's where I grew up. We, we took the same nutrition growing up. We have the same a tendency in certain ways, especially in my generation. I, I'm a little younger than Ho Xiao Xian and Edward Young, uh, a little older than Cai Ming Liang um, and the newer generation. But I absorb the same nutrition from the same earth, uh, same tradition, same complexity. Uh, complex, like there's a certain thing you want to break through, um, or political senses that I share the same. But my training in filmmaking is down here in New York, so somewhat different. That put me in a kind of a strange place. Um, I consider myself as, it's, it's almost like an oddball, either there or here. I'm mainstream there <laughs> in Asia, not all, just in Taiwan, and art house here. My film <laughs> will be blockbuster over there. It's like big release, and here, um, other than the Hulk, it's always being platform release, and th this will uh, probably go bigger than my my usual. So that's a little nerve wracking for me. So I, I don't know uh, where where am I at sometimes. I feel I'm floating, but uh, I, I the the actual Chinese culture I I absorbed it in, in Taiwan. So I was very influenced by. Uh, King Hu, or Li Hanxiang, this kind of uh, older generations. They came from China and they put the picture of how the Chinese look, not just from history book or how the school teaches you or how your parents teach you, um, but the visuals of China is set by those filmmakers. So my idea of China is, is like that in the picture. When I go back to China, it doesn't look like that. But I still is insist on that old-fashioned Chinese, you know. I think that will, something like Crouching Tiger, will feed back to Chinese culture. Uh, that's how culture and history goes. So those older filmmakers uh, that really influenced me, not only uh, in filmmaking, because I grew up watching their movies, but also uh, culturally, uh, just visualize China and how Chinese should behave. That has a big impact on me. I think that feedback to my audience today, to the younger generation, um, not only in the Chinese society, Taiwan, it's kind of going global now. Um, so it's it's an interaction. I'm not close friends with any, any of them, as close as like James, but we're we're, we're the same gang, I say. Well, you mentioned the audience, uh, and you have such an uh, international perspective yourself, and there's so much talk now. You know, the international audience uh, for all films is bigger than the American audience, which is a change from... So do you perceive, or like when you speak with industry people, what's, how would you define the difference between the American audience and the global audience, if there is a difference? They are similar and similar every day. I think the movie is really established by the American, you know, the mainstream movies. That's got to have an impact global-wise. So there is a market of mainstream audience that's sort of quite universal. Uh, a producer will answer you that question a lot better than I do. And then there is a crust of art house. There seems to be very similar, too. Uh, they don't have a lot of difference in the, no, across the street from here or our house in Taiwan or in Korea. Or, you know, they, they have a very similar taste. Um, I, I think they're similar and similar. I think in some ways, uh, to me, the audience in American 
has a certain stubbornness. <laughs> like things has I'm not talking about intellect like, like yourself or people sitting here. Like like a like a mainstream audience. There's certain ways the American do they establish cinema global wise. They are very much insist on the rules of that. I think the global audience seems to be more flexible. Uh, that's how I notice them. I think because cinema, a lot of the cinema language and ways, you know, how genres work are established here. Uh, for long enough, people get a little stiff, uh, insistent on certain ways of doing. That goes from Hollywood to critics to uh, your broader audience. Uh, that phenomenon is, I, I found, global-wise, is a lot more flexible. They're le less trained. But these days, they get similar and similar because everybody's watching pretty much the same movie, whether it's uh, art house or mainstream movies. And no, nobody makes mainstream movies like Americans, so everybody still watch American mainstream movies. Yeah. That's, that's a, a global. America makes movies to feed the global wise art, not just for Americans. They're less and less American, more and more global. It's funny that you, ironically, you broke into the mainstream in the biggest possible way, though, with Crouching Tiger, which was such a sensational international success. And had you uh, been a martial arts uh, fan, I mean, going back to King Hu and Touch of Zen and so on, or did you, is it something you had uh, fallen into more recently? I mean, what, what kind of kicked off your, your uh, interest to such an extent you wanted to make a film like that? I was 45 when I made the movie, so it was like I was dealing with my childhood fantasy and midlife crisis. <laughs> 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 yeah, I grew up with those movies. Uh, King Hu, it's uh, one of the starter doing the, the martial art, the wuxia style, which has a long tradition from the, the Pulp Fictions that we secretly read growing up and also the Cantonese the producing Hong Kong, those B movies, black and white, you know, you know. Uh, they don't fight with f fists and stuff, they fight with swords, so it's the swords type. It's more acrobatic, it came from the tradition of picking opera and those pulpy fictions. Um, so that's, it's all superheroes. Uh, so growing up you have to know those things. And then, uh, then Zhang Che's the other directors, t contemporary, he started a f fist fight. You know, the guy's shirts off and you know, doing fist fight, not based on weapons. And then Bruce Lee came along in that tradition. So there, there are actually two schools of martial art film. One is the, the fist type, more grounded. The other is the, the wire work, flying in the air. That's King Hu, sort of one of the starters. So they both take their way. Sometimes they combine, sometimes they separate. And in the meantime, we, I grew up at the same time, just a little bit before that, there, there were 10 years of the, the operatic movies, musicals. They're all feminists, even men played by women. And so that, that's an important period for me too, as I sing the songs, everybody watched those operatic movies, it's very feminine, tear jerkers, uh, fantasy tales, social satires, what have you, but they're all singing. And then people get tired of all this feminine stuff and they go for the, you know, the shirts off, fight. <laughs> um, so I, I grew up with those movies, um, both made in, many in Hong Kong, but some in Taiwan. And Taiwan, of course, you have those uh, propaganda uh, movies, like life is healthy, you know, that kind of uh, movie. They call it new realistic realism, Taiwan new realism movies. So I grew up with those movies, plus Hollywood movies, uh, nothing artistic, but it's, you know, that's the kind of upbringing I had. So in Crouching Tiger, I sort of blend all of them together. It's a really a hybrid of how I grew up. It's like a feedback of, you know, what I took in. So actually it's a mixture, it's not really a genre film. In that kind of genre, the first minute you sit down, you want people to know that you're in the right theater, that they start a fight, like, yeah. you know, before the seat is hot, uh, it's warm. 
And I prolonged that to 15 minutes before the first fight, and our hero dies at the end for some trivial reason. So I really defy that genre. People really have like raised their eyebrows about that movie in in the Chinese ter territory. It is, it's not quite a genre, but here because you don't have the burden uh, of the history, so people just take it, soak, soak it in really easily. Uh, it, it works actually a lot better here. It's really a hybrid. Uh, but basically for me, that's whatever I took in, I, I, I feed back. And so then was the Hulk uh, the continuation or culmination of your uh uh, midlife crisis and uh, yeah, there are five years I made these two movies. Okay. That's my version of midlife crisis. <laughs> so, what yes. do you are you amazed or are not at all surprised at the uh, overwhelming uh, success now of what Marvel has done with that all their characters and Avengers and so on? Did you see that coming at the time? Yeah, uh, no, I, I didn't know. I when I make the Hulk, there's no such genre. You know, there are successful movie made from the comic book. I have a lot of respect for the comic book, I, but I, I didn't know, or let alone respect for the genre, because the superhero wasn't not, not a genre. I, I made the movie like a psychodrama and a horror film from the 70s, uh, 60s Italian movies. That, that's the genre I took on. It's a psychodrama uh, that I did. Unfortunately, the right before us, the Spider-Man comes on. It becomes a genre, so the studio have to sell like Spider-Man. I don't think the movie gets a a good shot. I didn't lose money or anything, but you know, but it, it was an odd uh, situation because I, I wasn't aware of that was coming uh, the superhero genre. Um, so out of and it's doing so well. Yeah. You know. It's enormous now, of course. Yeah, it's um, a very successful genre. But back then, when I when I did the movie, uh, not really. Mm -hmm. no. So, two other American films you made actually before were uh, the Ice Storm and uh, Ride with the uh, Devil. And so that those are so different, you know, and so interesting, and two very specific milieu in American life. And what what attracted you to each of those two? Uh, rather rarefied topics and civil war is never done you know and that's what one of the amazing striking things about the film is that it's a very specific aspect of the war uh that is never seen i'm just so i'm wondering what what lured you to those two two subjects you know i, I grew up in taiwan i choose to live in this country um, um, unlike my children they have no choice they're born here as a chinese american but i, I chose to live here uh, partly because you know, the film industry, uh, I want to make movies here, because uh, nobody make movies like American. It's very attractive. It's like if you're into space, you work for NASA. If you're a basketball player playing the NBA, it is like the NBA for me. So it's very attractive. But other than that, I, I think I, I choose to like American ideas. You know? Americans, a country, is not, it's not come together by history or blood, genes, or from the earth, the taste of earth or culture. It's, it, it comes together by an idea. So that's, that's something very special. Uh, I like that idea. So I, I think all my American film, even including The Hulk, is somewhat of an American study, my two cents in uh, how I feel about America, what America should be, what America is struggling on. So that, no, I cannot live here and choose to live here and raise my children here and even somewhat take roots here without like paying attention to it and feedback. So those are the movies just naturally attracts me. They're not, they're probably not mainstream, <laughs> but that's my, my two cents, so to speak. And I didn't create those material. You know, those books attracts me, and and also James is a good feeder for you no know, something interesting, like the ice storm. He said, "Oh, me and my wife were we're big fans of this young writer. It's very interesting." So it's not even for movies. So there's the second book I read about you know, Rick Moody's work, and on page two hundred exactly, there's one image of the kid being electrified, sliding down the ice. 
just that image made me want to make the movie. And so that was interesting. I, I, I got more nervous when the movie hits the mark, when I, like halfway into making the movie, oh, this is like hitting some nerve. Like nobody make this movie. Uh, the same, same thing with uh, Brokeback Mountain. So I, I thought that was the Our House movie, strictly Our House. When it hits the shopping mall, I start getting nervous. Oh, people are gonna lynch me, okay, cowboy. <laughs> what did I do? So, uh, that movie's kind of, I, I was quite nervous making the, um, the Ice Storm. Like when I start doing my research, the, the first thing I noticed, people didn't seem to want to remember 1973. They remember 72, 74, but no, 73, they don't remember. I have a sense that I, I, I probably step into the minefield, like, oh, it's a dangerous thing. Um, it's touchy. But I, I did the film. I, I never seen anything like that about America in 73, but it's, it's so truthful. Uh, same thing with Rival the Devil. I can be bashed by critics by, like, what is this movie? But I sometimes I feel you see there there's a it's a cultural convention I didn't know history of cinema and cultures that I wasn't aware of. I'm a fresh eyes. It's like when I do three D something actually very realistic because camera catches whatever is real. But when you see things, you see in your mind's eyes. You put it together. You have your habits. Uh, that I wasn't aware of. I was fresh eye. I was like fresh camera. When I make those movies, I did my research. Uh, linguistically, I want to go back to history, the look, and you know, I did all my history works. I work harder than anybody. No, I, I'm a foreign filmmaker. When I do those films, I don't assume I know, and I didn't know. So they're actually kind of accurate, but they don't necessarily hit. <laughs> Because culturally, they're, they're different than American movies have made. So uh, those movies are in an awkward place. They're commercially f flopped. But over the years, there seems to be a turnaround. People appreciate those movies. You know. Now, I haven't seen it, but I think there are two versions of uh, Ride with the Devil, and there was one that came out, and then you did a longer one. Uh, did you have to just cut it down? more at the last minute to put it in theaters, and do you much prefer yeah. the version that's... If uh, I know it was a flop, I wouldn't cut them down, so... <laughs> uh, commercial flop, the movie, I'm very proud of uh, the movie. Uh, I, I think it's a pretty great experience for everybody who makes the movie. Uh, it rings true to many, many people, I think. So when... Um, uh, when they ask me to do a, a blue rate of the movie, uh, Criterion, they're very nice. They did the ice storms. Oh, the next movie, um, it'd be cool to put it up. I said, how about a, um, a director's cut? I never do director's cut. I struggle every movie with producer, studio, whatever, big or small, but I never regret. I think the one I put up is always the best. Uh, that's the one movie, there's some things I cut out, I think I, sh I probably shouldn't. Uh, not just bec because of the pr time pressure to make it shorter, but at that time, I, was, uh, I don't know what I was thinking, I should put it back. So I have second thoughts about those, and I I'm glad I get to do that. On Brokeback Mountain, uh, I mean, it's been a few years now, but uh, uh, I know you spoke about him at the time, but. What would you like to say about uh, Heath Ledger now, in retrospect, working with him, what kind of actor he was, and uh, when you remember him, what do you remember uh, in your working relationship most intensely? Uh, intensely, that's, just, <laughs> yeah. yeah, he's an intense actor. Um, you know, people complain, they don't understand what you're saying, but they're affected by him because the whole time, for two months, he's biting his teeth like that. <laughs> it's clinched like it's for the entire two months. The next, it's unfair to the next movie he's make, making, it's a comedy. The next day after we wrapped, he flew to, to Venice to make a comedy, just to relax. Uh, he's a very intense actor. Um, a superb actor. Um, I don't know if I'm good friends with those actors when they're so intense. It's work, working. 
And when you're working on a char career, a character together, a movie together, you give each other your best. So as a person, I, I hardly, sometimes I feel I hardly know him, but as a director, actor, uh, it was very in intense. You know. I was wrecked after the two Midlife Crisis movie, so I barely had the strength to finish that movie. Mm -hmm. So the shot was very modest. I didn't have any cinematic ambition. I just want to make a movie about love. Uh, I, we're up in the beautiful Canadian mountains and south, southern Alberta. All the actors are wonderful. It's very loving. Um, so it's a wonderful shooting experience for me. And the actors are young and, you know, scarily good. Uh, it's a sc it scares me how good they are you know, they're like in the early 20s. Heath was like 20, he was the oldest. He was only 24, 25. It's brilliant. Uh, he worked very closely, do anything. Uh, I remember there was his ranching. I remember the, when he first left Brokeback Mountain, he'd go to an alley, start to vomit, you know, ranching. Um, we were shooting something else. It was, just, it was a low budget film, kind of an indie film. I was shooting somewhere, and then I see a piece of cloud coming. I say, oh, let's move on to that shot, because I want to catch the cloud in the you know, four o'clock lights, and it's in the alley. We put on the board for in the palm uh along the wall. So it's, oh, hurry up, hurry up. And he has to punch the wall, and, and screaming, and, and ratching. And it was a beautiful shot. Of course, it, it's not going to get in the first take. So on third take, he did really well. Everything goes well. And it was a long take. Oh, could you just doing a little have trouble hearing, so just to make sure you have the mic. Oh. Yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Um, did, did you miss much of what I said? Oh. I was just saying, so the shot is about him punching the wall, and by the third take, he he's started to bleed. He's punching so hard. Um, and the shot seems to be okay. But I, I thought there's something I want to make an adjustment. So I went up to him and said, do you have one more? Not only is punching, bleeding, he's like, he's really giving it. After three takes, like, it's, it's still reaching the, the limit. And the assistant director also, also produced it. It's an older gentleman. And he was like, oh, that's bullshit. You can't do it. <laughs> The actor's bleeding. <laughs> that was a good shot. You know, he's, I've been in business like a long time. You don't want to do that again. Plus, we have many shots to come. Th that's a good take. You know, what are you doing? Oh, yeah. So I went up to Heath. He said, let's do it. It feels good. Let's do it. <laughs> let's do it. <laughs> so the fourth take, that's the one of my favorite shots in my whole career. There's a piece of beautiful clouds just coming, tumbling weeds, and the background cowboy who look at him get it's skull at. It's perfect. It's like so beautiful. It's a perfect shot. He didn't mind bleeding, you know. It's a heart wrenching scene. He's, he's a real, genuine, real actor. You know, I, I try to avoid watch uh, that Batman movie where he played Joker. Yeah. It was very disturbing to me to watch him on screen. It, it really hurts. I don't know how to talk about him. But I know that. Um, Just make sure you hold, hold the mic up. Yeah, yeah. But I know that uh, when when you work on a character with an actor, you go really deep uh, with them. I don't care about friendships, social addict, whatever. You're in the zone um, that you're giving each other the best, and I think he's at his best. I think he sees me too, and I want to remember him on the screen and, and the work that we did together. Uh, I, I miss him. It hurts to think about him, actually. I can imagine, yeah. Well, you know, I, want, I don't know whether you watch your films with different audiences, but I'm wondering in that case, uh, if there was, you felt a difference in the vibe of the audience, let's say if you were watching it in New York or LA or someplace like that, and if you ever watched it, let's say, in Texas or Wyoming or Montana or someplace like that, where it's a totally different kind of audience, were there wildly divergent reactions to in the that film? That movie? Different kinds of 
audiences? You mean Brokeback Mountain? Yeah. Strangely enough, it's very universal. Uh, people are saying, oh, the mid-American, you know, it's scary if you bring in a movie. No, you have to give them credit, it's the same. Uh, I think they're more open-minded there than, uh, than in San Francisco. I have some strange you know, uh, encounter in front of People ask strange questions. But I went to Denver, I went to Wyoming, and in Dallas. It was very, very warm embrace in the movie. Uh, there will be theaters like full of cowboy hats. They're not coming like <laughs> in great spirit, like only almost celebratory. Um, so the preconception of how regions work, it, it it's not true. Uh, so I'm glad I had the chance to find out because of that movie, because I travel with it. Um, no, it was it's uh, you know same thing in Taiwan or anywhere else. The, the response being quite universal. That movie, not, not all the movies like that, but with that movie, um, if people go to the theater, it's pretty much the same. But of course, there's a, a chunk of people, you cannot pull them to see that movie. Um, it, it's strange when we're going to the, through the Oscar campaign, when it hits 80 million, the box office, you say, oh, no, we still have like two, three weeks to go, we're gonna hit 100, whatever, and it just stopped. Just steadily stop. It's before Oscar, the hottest time for the movie, and it just stopped. It feels like whoever wants to see the movie already seen the movie, <laughs> maybe twice. Is that to that style? You can't put more people to see the movie. So that's also true too. I don't know where that come from, uh, but my experience sitting in the theater with the audience, very much the same. Uh, I think people are very affected by that movie. It was also an important movie, even though the role was not huge for uh, Anne Hathaway, and I think yeah. you think very highly of her as well, don't you? She is so good. I was amazed. I don't even have time, but when I auditioned her, <laughs> I, I didn't know her. I'd never seen those princess movies. <laughs> um, the casting director said, "You think this is crazy, but I think she's she's great for the role." Uh, she's gonna come in in her lunch break. She's shooting right at the at the lot. I was un at the Universal lot because the focus is inside of Universal. Uh, she's shooting a par parade scene, and she's gonna come in and apologize for her look. Uh, <laughs> so just don't mind that because she has to go back to shoot. Uh, so ignore that. She's she's a good actress actually. So I met her. She come in the princess like. <laughs> Totally princess dress coming. Of course, apologized profusely for her look and the makeup. And say, oh, the role is Texas princess, not far off. Just do your thing. Just, just fake a Texas accent. Just see how it looks. Oh, it was just, it was just lovely. And of course, she got the part. Before that, people don't really see her as a serious actress, but she is. She's a, you know, she was like 21 or so. Uh, really, really brilliant. Um, no, I think I did the right choice, uh, there's no doubt. Uh, no, I'm so glad to see her, her career blossom, and, and she deserves everything. Um, but I remember there's one shot when she's in one of her early scenes, she watched Jake Gyllenhaal do the bow riding, and when she come up, it's just such blossom of beauty, and like, I was so happy that I captured that. What, uh, you, you, all your choices are so unexpected. Are there any, is there some sort of film in the future you want to make sure you make? I mean, is there, uh, I remember many, many years ago, uh, it was his final visit to the United States, I had the great fortune to meet David Lean, and I asked him that question, he completely shocked me when he said, you know, I'd really like to make a musical. <laughs> and so that came out of left field, and so is there, either, is there some kind of film uh, science fiction or, or uh, musical or anything else that you were really one day determined to do? Uh, I don't know. I don't have a checklist, to be honest with you. Uh, many people approach me with musicals. Uh, I guess because of Crouching Tiger, they think, you know, there's one meal I had with my agent. I turned down five musicals. 
So, <laughs> so a lot of people approach me with musicals. Um, I, I found that's hard. Uh, I have to find the right niche because these days just people feel like it and start singing. Uh, I, I think <laughs> it, it's harder than the 50s, 60s. Uh, I think the audience doesn't quite have that innocence anymore. You have to find the new excuses and form and to do that. So when the, um, when the chance comes, the right material, I'll certainly give it a try. Um, I will probably be afraid to try ghost story. Because, you know, I, know I become the film I'm making. I, I'm really getting to that world. I think that would be probably very scary. I can treat a movie like a ghost story, but you know, the actual ghost story probably really scare me. But other than that, I'm open to anything. <laughs> Do you have anything in mind uh, oh, I, right I now know, for, your next, thing, for your next film? Yeah. Another thing I, I think will be really scary for me is a movie that doesn't have any meaning, just entertaining. I think that would be very challenging to me because I wouldn't know what to do. Um, I, I sort of glue on what it means before I uh, you know, ripple out to how I want to do it. Uh, for like, like Pi, those, those shots, those visualized, you know, highly visualized shots, if I don't know how the character means what it means to the movie, I probably didn't know where to start. But some comedians or some movies that's pure entertaining and it's great, it gets you to the highest place, where there's no reason. You know, uh, I, I think that's, that's the most incredible thing. I don't know how to do it. Or just something just funny that doesn't you know, you know, mean anything. You don't realize anything, it's just like funny. If somebody put a gun against my head, so I'd just be funny. I probably wouldn't know what to do. I think that'd be really challenging. But other than that, those two, I, I, I don't know. I'd try anything. Well, we'll look forward to your meaningless film. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> very, very much. Um, but you, you don't have anything specific in mind for your next film. I suppose you'll take a little... Uh, uh, no, no. no. Don't don't hand me the script or anything. After okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I don't have anything in, in mind. Yeah. Well, you do uh, deserve a, a vacation. Maybe a nice Pacific cruise would be uh, something. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, but best of luck with uh, Life of Pi. I think it's uh, launched into the world now, and uh, you know I expect uh, wonderful things for it. And it's uh, thank you for bringing that film, and thank you so much for coming today. It's been a wonderful uh, wonderful to listen to you talk about your work and your life. Uh, it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. Thank you. I should remember the place. Sorry about the microphone thing. Thank you. Myself, as filmmakers, we don't know people, studios, or you know, film critics categorize us. I think we're a bunch of racing horses. You know, we're at the, the gate. You know, once the gate goes, we just run the run. And the studio could sort of rain us a little bit, or producer. <laughs> <laughs> and, and people, you know, judges who runs first, or whatever. Uh, we don't know. We like have a, like a tunnel vision. Mm -hmm. we're, we're like that. We just, you know. So for me, there are the movies I want to make. I don't know what kind of filmmaker I am, or even am I an author? If people say I am, I am. And some don't see me as an author, because how can an author go you know, different genres? Um, so I, I don't know myself. I don't know the answer. It's up to people to categorize my myself. But I, I'll say a few things regarding to that. Uh, I have a lot of curiosity. I feel my career is like a prolonged film school. I, I just love to learn how to make movies. How do you do this? How do you do that combat scene? How do you put boys with guns on horseback? Uh, how, how do you fly, you know, putting a wire on people, just yank them this way and slash them that way? Uh, now, for different genres, I get to learn movies from all those great filmmakers like Hong Kong action choreographer, that's some of the greatest filmmakers. Here, they're, they make sure you're doing safely. Is the, 
is a storyboard artist that do the visualization. And, and Hong Kong is the choreographer. The people didn't go to school. They're some of the smartest filmmaker. And how about England, those you know, dry sense of humor. The, the, every place they have their way of filmmaking. That just fascinates me. I just want to learn from them. And my biggest pleasure in making movies, watching people good at what they're doing they're, when they're focused, they're like Pi training the tiger. He's in the God zone. Nothing else better. They don't need church. They don't need nothing. When I, no, I met as a pilot, he's like the best assistant director in the world. Like three aircrafts in the air, and he's coordinate with the cameraman. He must be like a great cinematographer, the best AD. In seconds, you know, in the stretch of like, from here to there, nothing bump, you know, kill anybody. Mm -hmm. Catch that light in this shadow, you know, all the calculation, and he's like in that zone. It just fascinates me. Or the tiger trainer in this movie, why day after day, as long as he extends, he, he needs to go to that, you know, tigers don't play. They're not actors. When they do this, they're for real. And you do anything wrong, when you're out of the zone for half a bit of a second, make the wrong decision, you're dead. So when people are in that zone, you know, some of us is to leave for this kind of thing. So I don't know why, why Life of Pi take me there, but it's, there's a calling. When there's a calling, or what does a Wyoming gay cowboy has anything to do with me? I don't know. I grew up in Taiwan. Uh, <laughs> But why did I cry over that? You know, why do I want to go to that mountain? Why did I not go to this you know, and that? I seem to be a nice guy. Why did I make Hulk? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> or American Civil War. I, I know I keep attending um, an art house film or not an art house film. So it's kind of it's stuck in the middle. Um, so I put it aside. But it's, 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 it's a project that keeps haunting me. Uh, when I say haunting me, it's not like this is the greatest book I ever read. It's just their elements just keep bugging me. Something I want to find out. And then about four years ago, four or five years ago, Fox started to you know, approach me. Um, I didn't really want to <laughs> believe anybody would do that. Take what it takes to make to find out what it's, it's, it's going to be like. Um, but then my friend Tom, I think he's here today. He, he called me. First, Elizabeth the Gabler. Mm -hmm. It's her film. Uh, she approached me, like eight months pursuing. Oh, I don't know, I don't know. <laughs> and then Tom, I read this, the previous script before me. It's a good script. And the second story is in there. I said, okay, they're, they mean, they're gonna do this. And Tom gave me a number, like, Around that range, I'll do it. Uh, maybe they really want to do it. So it's a long decision process. It's not like one day, ah, oh, I got it. Uh, actually, one of the pivotal points is when I thought of 3D. Uh, maybe if I add another dimension, maybe it'll work. Maybe I have a chance. It's a silly idea. I didn't even know what 3D meant. <laughs> um, then I started to thought about it can, if I can have a narrator. Because the book has a, it's a very mature voice mm -hmm. about a 16-year-old boy. So if I can find a mature voice, maybe I can. Yeah. Then I thought about in the preface, there's Yamatel fake this story about how he got a story. So I make that kind of a reality. It's also kind of a joke, but you know, I started to see things working. And as I was in the process, I, I kind of fall into the trap. Um, then we went through an adventure. I can s spend three days tell you what happened. Um, it's constant decision making. It's actually an adventure. Eventually, I become the movie I'm making. I'm like pie, uh, drifting across the Pacific with the tigers. Like, um, and yesterday, I feel I was ashore. <laughs> well, I thought last night. I thought Richard Pena made a very good uh, had a good, very good insight into your career. Uh, is that um, I mean you? Uh, each project is such a surprise, so much, so very different from the one before. And then he said, you know, the way we usually think about great directors is uh, they kind of establish their own world and they work within that world and so on. But then there are some, and I think uh, Ang, you represent this, that each film is like a new exploration. 
a new exploration maybe of uh, your own interests, uh, aspects of yourself, aspects of things that maybe you don't know about that you want to find out about. How do, how did you, uh, how do you feel about that kind of uh, description? Does that sit, sit sweat. well with you? Yeah? yeah. <laughs> when it's introducing me, you know, him in New York Festival, which I regard as a highbrow festival. Uh, yeah, I just keep sweating, and I don't know, it's the suit or whatever. It's, it's actually quite uncomfortable. Uh, it's actually, it's not only talk about you know, a great or even good filmmaker, he's talking about auteur. Yeah. Uh, what does that mean? What does that French word mean? You, know, you have many interpretations. Am I an auteur? Or I'm just like, I, you see, I always thought I'm learning what I like to learn. A uh, big pivotal time was I came to the state, actually, I start, um, you know, the, the ac actual really good dramatic education. I went to NYU film school. But didn't you um, go to Chicago first? Uh, Champagne. Yeah, because I wondered, wasn't that a rather big deal or bold thing to do to decide you're come, gonna come to the States uh, no, to every, study at every, that time? Every good student sort of come abroad mm. at that time in Taiwan. We finish college, you finish your military service, and then you go abroad, mostly to America. Now, to go further study, that give you a life, like a better start, whether you go to Tai, go back to Taiwan or stay here. Um, so I just follow, well, my father didn't want me to go to, you know, do anything entertaining. So I sort of made a deal with him, just, just let me do this. I'll go to a theater school, uh, study theater, get a degree in America, maybe I can start teaching. You know, uh, so maybe sometime you grow up. Said, change your mind, so you can still have like a, a respectable job. Yeah. So that's why I came here, but of course I never did that. You know, um, what I did sense sensibility. My father said, you know, at this rate, I got seven nominations for the Oscar. At this rate, maybe you get your first Oscar in age fifty. Maybe you can start teaching things, something for real. <laughs> <laughs> You're happy? Yeah. <laughs> um, but that's my relation with my yeah. father. Yeah. Are you an only child? No, my, I have a younger brother and okay. two older sisters. So was that your first uh, trip to the United States when you came to be a student here? Had you been out yeah. of Taiwan uh, much In before Taiwan, that? Taiwan, didn't speak much English no? at all. I spoke like uh, you saw the sailor on the screen, yeah. you must uh, go, like that sort of English. Uh, half of the class I didn't understand, but I was learning, taking a lot. So what was it like for you at NYU? Uh, did you make uh, friends, associations? Uh, wh what were you actually doing? Uh, did you start making, making movies, films yourself? what yeah. I really like to do. Yeah. I was like really happy and fulfilled. Yeah. So I, I love theater. I, I think at first I wanted to be an actor, but then I didn't speak English, I couldn't act, I couldn't get the parts. <laughs> and I had to direct, and I got so pissed. <laughs> As a young student, I thought, oh, theater directors are losers. The best ones go to acting, and I don't want to direct theater, who cares about them? If I, wanted, if I have to direct, I, I'll direct movies. So I, I got into at NYU, and it was like, Everything turned out to be so easy, just sight and sound, just go shoot stuff, tell a story with, with the camera. So that was like easy. I don't need to speak much English. Well, theater's talking head, it's, it's mm. very verbal culture. But uh, cinema is, it's, it's a strange thing, I just click right away. I did it because it's really easy and, <laughs> and everybody listened to me. I, I don't know why I didn't speak much English, I hardly had no much friend or anything, but on the set, if it's three people, five guys, uh, people start listening to me. I said, put this here, it's, you know. There are people who talk very sp I'll just say that I hope that uh, some of you were able to see uh, Life of Pi yesterday. It got the festival off to a fantastic start. <laughs> we're very, very, very uh, thrilled to have the film uh, here, and we're also, of course, thrilled this afternoon to have uh, Ang Lee with us to discuss uh, not only Life of Pi, but his entire career, which is certainly one of the most uh, adventurous, unexpected, eclectic, 
uh, and absolutely fascinating uh, careers that I can think of in modern cinema. So without further ado, let's welcome Ang Lee. Thank you, Todd. Thank you for coming. Well, it must have been a thrill last night because uh, you've been working on this film for so long, probably longer than any film you've, you've made, just to, to Twice, make it. Yeah. Twice, double, double the length. <laughs> and um, just to finally have it done uh, and now in front of an audience must, uh, must be a thrilling experience. Uh, yes, actually I was kind of relieved. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have time to like really enjoy it. Actually, yesterday, I was running around and introducing the film. I have a sense it's kind of working, so I started deflate and I was like, <laughs> <laughs> I felt I was in the battle zone for so long, for nearly four years. A lot of anxiety, uncertainties, doubt, as the movie says. Like I was being tested, taking battles, not with necessarily with people, but. What, whatever is in front of you. It was your own 200... Even a week ago, I was oh. still uncertain. Um, well. La last Sunday, I put it together uh, before I do some further tuning. The, for the first time, I saw all the elements sort of, sort of put together, and at the end, I started stopping. Not moved by the movie, I was just like, oh. Yeah. <laughs> well. So it is a relief uh, yesterday, so I could not think of anything that's beyond being relieved. Well, uh, I would, we'll talk about Life of Pi a little bit, obviously, but uh, we would, I hope you can uh, relax a little bit. We can speak about your entire uh, career in life because it's certainly been, uh, uh, as I said, an adventurous and very interesting one. But my big question about Pi is that, as we know, Fox uh, bought the film 10 years ago and uh, other directors tried to make the film and so on. And what was it that gave you the confidence that it could actually be realized properly on screen, because uh, this is a, it takes you to another world that uh, we've never really been in before, and it's an exceptionally beautiful film. But what what convinced you that you could pull this film off and to join on board with it? Uh, I was never convinced, even to this day, <laughs> <laughs> to be honest with you. But that's not what it is about. Like I know how to do it. I want to show how how it's done. It was never like that. It's like, yeah, that's the adventure I want to go. Whether you decide to make the leap or not. Uh, it's only that decision. When I first read the book, is shortly after the book came out, somebody introduced me, oh, that's an interesting book. I remember thinking nobody in their right mind would put 15 million into this movie. It's like, it's a philosophical book. It's cinematic written, fascinating, mind-boggling, but it'd be too expensive. And we don't even know if we can do it. So it's so much unknown, and there's no way it should be. If I were the losing side, anybody lose, I have great sympathy for it. I want to make about them. I don't want to make the Yankees, but I make the you know, people lose the war in the South. I, I don't know. Uh, I don't know why a floating island attracts me. I, you know, I don't know those things. Sometimes after the movie, people ask you to give them answers, and I, I don't really <laughs> have them. I, I literally, I feel like a racing horse. Those, it's like there's a fate, there's a calling in me. When I feel that, I have to jump in and make the movie. So I, I, I don't really know if I'm an author or not. I just feel like I, I just love to be basking in this large film school mm -hmm. that I just keep making movies one after another, and people seem to respond, a lot of them. It changes their lives. <laughs> Change my life. Uh, I live for that kind of thing. Well, I would love to explore a little bit about something I don't know much about, which is your uh, youth and uh, upbringing and how you uh, latched on to cinema in the first place. Uh, what kind of a kid were you? Were you uh, reading a lot, seeing movies, uh, cultural family? Uh, what, what was your, how did you get on the track that took you into the arts? I, I was a very uh, spaced out and docile kid. Nothing showed I would be an artist in the future. And the way I grew up was very uh, repressed in that way, and artistically. Uh, some of you grew up in that environment in Asia, maybe. 
uh, go to a good college and be useful man is the thing to do. Basically, academic life, which I could not put my my focus on. I was a very docile child. I was never rebellious. I never felt rebellious until I was like 45. <laughs> and I started to make martial art films. I started to defy this and that. It never really come out, or how out, as you say. I never say a word again. My father is a very stately man. He's the principal of my high school. That's pretty bad. <laughs> Uh, he's a good principal, I was a good student, um, and that was the best high school in Taiwan. So it was very boring, I don't really have any play. Or I play a little bit of basketball weekends, watch one movie, two movies a week probably. Uh, I was just very spaced out, my mind is drift. I, I don't know. So how did you uh, discover? I felt like oh. a lot of waste of my time, mm -hmm. but I was brooding I guess, mm -hmm. and then I flunked the college examination feel like a loser uh, and because you know in Taiwan you have to do military service when you reach 20 so I I got into the Academy of Art um, you know, just nobody paid attention just so I had like a hideout place before the <coughs> next year's exam national exam uh, and first time I stood on stage it just bang on you know, I was electrified I was saying that's it that's I remember the spotlights like this shining on my eyes. I sort of can feel it wasn't like this, that you, you're lit. You know, it was dark out there, and I feel I belong to somewhere in the dark. And like my soul started to come out or something. Um, that I, I want, that's what I want to do. I was 18 years old. That's the first time I had a taste of art or theatrical or dramatic experience. And ever since, I just keep 